Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another brand new episode of the Word of the Day podcast. My name is Jamie Silva. I am your host, and I am distinctly pleased to be back here behind the mic once again, pleasantly explaining another useful word to you all. And I'm even more pleased to welcome to the show, making her first appearance, the talented voice actor Sarah. Uh, Sarah, thanks so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, no time for pleasantries. Let's get down to business, because today's word is very cool, it's very useful, and we've got a lot to say about it. This is the verb anthropomorphize. Well, that's rather a mouthful. It is, isn't it? Go ahead and say it with us, folks. Anthropomorphize. Anthropomorphize. Anthropomorphize, yes. There's also the adjective form, anthropomorphic, and the noun, anthropomorphization. And I promise these are all as much fun to spell as they are to say. Now, in my opinion, this verb means to treat something non-human as if it is human, or at least has human qualities, like feelings, desires, thoughts, or reasoned non-instinctual reactions to the world around it. Merriam-Webster, meanwhile, defines anthropomorphize as, quote, to attribute human form or personality to things not human, unquote. So, pretty similar, but notice that they add the idea of seeing human forms in non-human things, like shapes or outlines that are reminiscent of people or faces. Sure. Cats, for example, sort of look like they're smiling, because their lips typically turn up at the corners. This physical trait makes their faces appear more human, or anthropomorphic, as we just learned. Turning now to the personality side of things, what if I were walking along the beach and I saw a sand crab skittering along? Well, in this situation, I might say something like, Oh, hey, little guy, what's going on? Oh, you're going to burrow down in the sand? Oh, shy, are we? Well, bye. Probably just wanted to get home to his little crab family, poor guy. So, Jamie, what's happening here? What am I doing? Well, it seems like you're treating that little crab as... Oh, excuse me. If we could, is it okay we call him Sheldon? Because of the shell? Precisely. Uh, okay. So it appears that you're treating Sheldon here as if he's shy, which is really more of a human quality. Like, insofar as we understand animal psyches, which admittedly is not fully, probably fear and the survival instincts are at play here. Not some sort of cross-species social anxiety, where this crab... Um, Sheldon. Where Sheldon is like, oh no, not a stranger. I'm in no mood to meet new people today. I'm really more of an introverted crab, you see, much like my cousin, the hermit crab. And plus, I've been going through a lot of changes recently, what with shedding my shell and everything. So I'd best beat a a quick exit and get back to my home and my crab kids and my crab wife who... uh, Sarah, is is this... is that going to be Shelly? Shelly, yes, probably. But anyway, all kidding aside, Jamie, you're quite right about this. By talking about and to Sheldon in this fashion, I'm applying all these human words and concepts, like shyness, a home, and a family, to a little sand crab. But those concepts really only apply in a metaphorical, analogous sort of way. Right. Like, in a sense, the place the crab goes for shelter or rest could be called a home, and there may be other crabs in its same brood or what have you. But it's not the same, and we have no sense of animals understanding those things in the same way we do. And as far as giving it a name and talking to it as if it can understand conversational English, well, that's another level of anthropomorphization entirely. Now, we realize that philosophers and zoologists and philosopher-zoologists may have various theories about the nature and limits of humanist consciousness in the animal kingdom and how it seems to range from, say, highly socialized chimpanzees on the one end to gnats on the other. Yes, and those theories, we are sure, are very interesting. But for our own narrow linguistic purposes in this episode, We need only establish that, first, humans and animals are fundamentally different beings, including and especially with respect to culture and communication, and second, that it is a very intriguing human tendency to treat animals rather like people in many ways. Not all animals, though. We are here mainly referring to two overlapping groups of animals, 
Number one, domesticated ones, and number two, cute or impressive ones. So you will not see much cooing and ooing and aahing over, say, feral weasels or big hairy spiders. But stuff like kittens and koalas, well, people just can't get enough of those. Well, but what about small, pretty, gray barnyard spiders named Charlotte? Those are pretty popular. Mm, Only if they can write cryptically complimentary phrases in their webs, though. Also, notice Charlotte was a barnyard spider. I'm not sure her web would have been so appreciated in the house. True, true. Uh, Not in my house, that's for sure. Anyway, folks, there's actually a technical term for this type of species. The kind that humans more easily identify with. Charismatic species. To understand what these are, we're going to turn to an intriguing research article published in 2018 in the Public Library of Science by three authors whose names look pretty French, so I'm going to let Sarah read them. Uh, Sarah, please. Oh, sure. Let's see here. Céline Albert, Gloria M. Luc, and Frank Cochon. So this article was entitled The 20 Most Charismatic Species. And charismatic, according to the Oxford Dictionary, means, quote, the powerful personal quality that some people have to attract and impress other people, unquote. Note, by the way, that people appears twice in that definition, showing that charisma has traditionally been thought of as a specifically human quality. Now, although it's not a perfect proxy, I think the word cool, in the sense of my friends are super cool, or this vintage book is really cool, this is pretty darn close to the meaning of charismatic. The Google definition of this sense of cool goes, quote, fashionably attractive or impressive. Excellent, unquote. Oh, and look at that. Attractive and impressive. The same terms as appear in Oxford's definition of charismatic. The parallels are striking indeed. Really, I suppose the researchers could have called their article the 20 coolest wild animals, but I'm sure you get tossed out of academia on your ear if you use normal, relatable words like cool instead of $5 words like charismatic. Indubitably. Unmistakably. Incontrovertibly. Irrefutably. Sorry, what were we talking about? Using normal, relatable words. Ah, yes. So, anyway, these researchers asked groups of adults and school children which wild animals they most associated with any of the following six words. Beautiful, dangerous, impressive, cute, rare, and endangered. Collectively, these words were treated as a gauge or a marker of charisma slash coolness in wild animals. Second, the researchers looked at which animals zoos featured on their websites. And finally, they tallied, quote, the animals featured on promotional posters for animated Disney and Pixar movies. And here's what they came up with. The top 20 most charismatic animals from the 20th to 1st. Here we go. Whale, koala, bear, rhino, dolphin, crocodile, shark, hippo, zebra, chimp, gorilla, wolf, polar bear, cheetah, panda, panther, giraffe, elephant, lion, and tiger. Hey, wow. Congrats, tigers. Most impressive. Lions, uh, better luck next time, I guess. I bet they would have topped the list when The Lion King came out, but it's been a long time. Now, the next obvious question would be, what is it about these animals that makes them so charismatic? The study opines, quote, the overrepresentation of mammals in the top 20 was expected given the general appeal of species that are phylogenetically or physiognomically closer to humans. Translating that into plain English, we weren't surprised that more mammals were perceived as charismatic, especially since their bodies and faces are more similar to humans compared to, say, reptiles. Which makes sense, right? We identify more with things that look rather like us. Those that have physical features we recognize and can relate to our own. Yeah, like that Merriam-Webster definition said, attributing human form to non-human things. And from form, it's a short leap to attributing human behavioral or personality qualities as well. Which is why, perhaps to ensure that their study would be mentioned here in this episode, the researchers explicitly mentioned that, quote, Charismatic species are often easily anthropomorphized. Well, there you go. That's exactly what we're saying. Now, Sarah, I understand that you're a bona fide artist, like like a your paintings hang in and can be actually purchased from galleries artist. And uh, animals are among your subjects. So my question is, do you perhaps anthropomorphize your animals at all? And if so, how? Why, yes, I do. 
For all of the animal characters I draw, I do create them to look realistic, but I also add in very human characteristics. For example, the common mouse character I draw, whose name, by the way, is Maximilian Franz Fitzwilliam III, but his friends call him Max. Uh, I craft his features to look like a real mouse, as opposed to something cartoonish like Mickey Mouse. However, Max always walks upright on his hind legs. He wears a vest, jacket, trousers, shoes, and a cap. He enjoys a good cup of tea and a plate of ginger biscuits. Hey, same here. Exactly. Very human of you both. And lastly, Max displays many facial expressions, which a real-life mouse would likely never make. And so Max is, indeed, a very anthropomorphized version of a mouse. Absolutely. He seems like a real dapper and genteel little rodent. Okay, up next, here's a quick look at the etymology of anthropomorphize. Longtime listeners might recall episode 17, which featured the word misanthropic, an adjective meaning disliking humankind and avoiding human society. Well, misanthropic combines the Greek word for hatred and the word for man slash humanity overall. And anthropomorphize combines the latter term with the Greek morphe, which means form or shape. So essentially, having the form or shape of a person. My, that Merriam-Webster definition just keeps looking better and better. Now, some linguists theorize that anthropos combines the Greek word for man with the word for eye or face. So then literally, anthropos means something that has the face of a man, which fits in just perfectly with what the study said about how charismatic species are usually physiognomically similar to humans. Because physiognomy just means, per Google, a person's facial features or expression. So there we go once again. It all fits together. So it does. So it does. Now, folks, you may never have said anthropomorphize before, and it's definitely one of the more esoteric, aka obscure, words we featured on this show, but I'm sure you've seen anthropomorphization happening absolutely all over the place. Heck, you probably do it yourself regularly. Because, let's face it, We humans are quite anthropocentric, which is sort of like self-centered, but collectively, as a whole species. Right. We see the world through our own eyes, literally as well as figuratively, I suppose, and we naturally fit other beings into categories we understand. Which makes sense. Like, what else would we do? I mean, I'm sure animals do the same thing, viewing everything through their own existential prism. Now, to illustrate the ubiquity, which that's from episode 30, The State of Being Everywhere or All Over the Place, uh, to illustrate the ubiquity of anthropomorphization, we've put together a very non-exhaustive list of anthropomorphized things you might run across or talk about in everyday life. First and foremost, we must mention any media involving animals doing non-animal things. This covers most kids' books, comics, artwork, movies and TV shows, and a lot of grown-up works of fiction as well. Yeah, this is a huge category. And quick aside here, two of Sarah's and my favorite cartoons are Bill Watterson's Calvin and Hobbes and The Far Side by Gary Larson. The latter comics feature talking, fully anthropomorphized animals in all sorts of human settings. That's where most of the humor comes from, actually. Calvin, meanwhile, is a spiky-haired six-year-old chock-full of mischief and imagination. Hobbes, his constant companion and best-slash-only friend, is a tiger, a mere stuffed toy tiger to everyone else in the comic strip, but as real as anything to Calvin, and by extension to us as readers. So really, the character of Hobbes is a fascinating study in anthropomorphization. Absolutely. And so... Is it any surprise that tigers topped the list of the most charismatic species? Hobbes is not surprised, that's for sure. Right, an extremely self-assured jungle cat, Hobbes is. All right, let's proceed with this list of commonly anthropomorphized things. I'll go with uh, teddy bears, or really any stuffed animal. Or any dolls, for that matter. Gingerbread men. Mascots. Cars, if you name them. Do you? I do. Our family's van when I was a kid was Rosie, the farm truck was Otis, and my car in college was Jake. And how about you? Does your car have a name? Not really, but sort of. It doesn't have a name like, you know, Joe or Jane, but I do call it The Studios on account of recording this very show in it for a long time. But we're not in the RAV4 Studios right now. No, no, we're not. As spacious as that interior is, it's just not the most comfortable spot for guests. And I found the sound quality is still quite good in normal home settings, so yeah, that's where we are. I see. 
Anyway, moving along, we've got jack-o'-lanterns. Those are little anthropomorphized gourds. Mm -hmm. And what about those super tall inflatable balloon people outside of like car dealerships? Or balloon animals. And then there's cats and dogs in sweaters or in strollers or wearing funny hats. Next up is robots, which arguably the more human they are, the creepier they are. Yes, it's uncanny. And finally, uh, what about plants? Plants? Yeah, plants. Anthropomorphized plants? How so? If you'll permit me to put on my sociologist hat for a moment. Uh, so many people have remarked on the growing tendency for folks, I think especially the younger set, our generation or below, to refer to their pets as their family. And at first, at one point, I think this was sort of in jest, like with a wink and a nod and an understanding that this is sort of pretend and the word doesn't quite apply fully to animals. But over the years, the humorous aspect seems to have fallen away. And nowadays, many pet owners unironically and genuinely refer to their pets not just as family, but as their children and refer to themselves as parents. And often they don't even qualify these words with something animal related by saying like, oh, I'm a dog mom or these are my fur babies, what have you. It's just like, oh, you know, I'm a mom. I say hello to my girls and it's, it's a couple of hamsters, which to be clear, I'm, I'm not here to chuckle at. We sociologists don't do such things. We would never. What do sociologists do? Oh, we just, we, we soberly observe, right? And we tilt our heads to one side and we murmur things like, hmm, and interesting. And we jot down notes in our little notebooks. You've really thought through this amateur sociologist thing a lot, haven't you? I, I don't know. I suppose so. I guess I just like observing people and society. Is, is that weird? Hmm. Interesting. Hey, stop that. And stop writing in a little notebook too. Anyway, folks, as I was saying, it seems to me that whatever else it may be, describing and in some ways treating one's pets as one's children, one's offspring, is a big leap forward in anthropomorphization. Fair enough, but what about the plants? I thought you were going to talk about oh, the plants. Yes, the, the plants. Thank you. So I think there may be another such leap in the offing. As I've recently noticed, a nascent, meaning just starting, a nascent trend of people referring to their houseplants as their kids and to themselves as you know, like plant moms or dads or plant parents, what have you. And once again, right now, I think it's slightly supposed to be funny and not serious, but I don't know, like down the road, maybe it'll be like, hey, it's a living thing. I take care of it. I feed it. I name it. It makes me happy. Ergo, basically, like I'm a parent and it's my kid. In fact, Jamie, your earlier use of the term pet owner is now perhaps a little questionable, a little gauche, at least in some circles. Because owner implies that the pets are mere property akin to a lamp or a shoe, rather than a treasured member of the household akin to, well, actual human kin such as children. You're right. Dear me, this is all so fraught, so delicate. As so often happens when language and societal norms are changing, as they basically always are, actually. So life is fraught, is I guess what I'm saying. All the more reason to use language with thought and intention, I suppose, eh? That's a tidy enough takeaway, certainly. So, sure. Shall we turn to the examples? Uh, yes, let's. Okay, example number one. I refuse to eat whole fish like trout because the eyes are just right there staring at you, said Mary. It just makes me shudder. Supper should not be anthropomorphic if we can possibly help it. Example number two. People say that ants are hard to anthropomorphize, but I disagree, said Kendall, proudly displaying his ant farm. All of them are named, of course, and I'd like to introduce you to a couple. That busy little guy over there is, is Andy, Andy the ant, right? Uh, he's a real go-getter. He loves to be out at the front of the line, leading the way. Andy's an inspiration to me, really. Uh, then there's Auntie Ant, uh, Auntie spelled A-U-N-T-Y, like an, like an aunt. I call her that because she's sort of the doting type, always checking up on the other ants, uh, tidying up around the nest. So sweet. Love her. Auntie Ant, by the way, is not to be confused with Auntie Ant. Auntie here, spelled A-N-T-E, like the poker term. I call him that because he's a bit of a gambler. He takes chances. Always trying to haul grains that are a little too big for him, getting into trouble here and there. It's a wonderful spunk, you know? Okay, folks, that'll do it for the examples, and that'll do it for today's show. 
Thanks very much for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. And Sarah, thanks very much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Mm -hmm. All righty. For everyone here on the Word of the Day staff, this is your host, Jamie Silva, saying so long from Not the Rav4 Studios. We will see you next time. And until then, as always, have a great day.